I mean, you know, it's 14 days to Christmas. You know, when I was a little kid, I, I loved Christmas. Doesn't kids love Christmas? Not because of the gifts that you're going to get, but you love Christmas because there's a feeling, you know, there's a sense. I don't know about, you know, in Australia today, but when we were in Sri Lanka, when we were growing up, there was a change in the atmosphere. There was a real, you know, sense of Christmassy, isn't it? I really believe, you know, so what we happened at, in our home was that uh, my, my mother and my father, they would get us to start to, you know, from the first of the month, we start Christmas of December. So we start to paint the house and, you know, clean the house up and do all sorts of stuff. And we used to enjoy it because as kids, we had to paint the house. You know, we didn't get people to come from out to paint the house. We had to paint the house. And we look forward to doing that because it sets a, it sets a scene and, 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 you know, the ambience for Christmas that's coming on the 25th. So we, we did all that stuff. And the best part of this is this. We used to get gifts, like clothing and all that only once a year. And, you know, we get a gift once a year. So we, we really look forward for it. Unlike today, the kids, you know, they, each time they go to Kmart or whatever, they get presents. My little grandchildren, whenever they go in and come out, they're coming out with presents. And I wonder, we, we never got that opportunity. Of course, we did have shops like Kmart. So we just had some boutiques where we go and buy some sweets and come out. But our kids, you know, these days are very different. You know, so it was, it was really fun. It was something to look forward. Even though we didn't realize that it is the birth of Jesus, we wanted gifts for ourselves. And we used to do that. And of course, nowadays in the shops, you find, you know, all sorts of, you know, uh, stuff to be sold in shops. It's highly commercialized. You know, uh, shop people also look forward to making more money during this time. And they start Christmas, not in December. They start somewhere in October. It starts to fill the shops. So it's all planning and all getting ready for Christmas. And it's fun, isn't it, in one way. It's fun because, of course, they're making money and all that stuff. But then, of course, there are the other crowd. The other crowd is planning their holidays, even at the beginning of the year, to celebrate the end of the year Christmas. And they take, you know, I know some of us are going on holidays to Sri Lanka and other parts of the world. And we are all getting ready for this amazing, amazing festival, if you want to call it. Amazing. But they forget that really Christmas is all about Jesus. And his birth, I mean, you know, we plan all this stuff. We get the best food. My wife has already bought, you know, stuff for Christmas, the roast and all. All that is all bought and kept. But are we really celebrating what the real purpose of it is about? We've got to stop and think because I think sometimes the church is running along with the ways of the world. The world doesn't care about Christmas. They only want the holidays. They want the gifts. They want, you know, you know the, the shops. want them just, you know, to have everything there for people to come and buy but are we really getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? You know, we all know that Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December. You know, scholars tell that he probably would have born during the month of February, February, March, during that time. Because it was the springtime in Israel, and uh, it was a period time when they were actually, you know, during February, during the springtime, you know, the, the, the sheep were laying lambs. And they used to call it the lambing period. You know that sheep only lay during the season? They don't lay, you know, not lay, I'm sorry. You know, give, lay, lay, give birth to, <laughs> give birth to, <laughs> they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not hens to lay chickens or eggs. They, they, <laughs> they give birth to lambs only during the, the period of February and March, during that time. So they said that Jesus was born during that time. And, uh, and what, what, see, this, it is so important to understand that why did the angels really appear to the shepherds? They really appeared to the shepherds because, you know why? Because they were preparing those lambs for the next year for the sacrifices that, they, that the Israelites would, would make. But, you know, what they did also was they would, uh, they would you know, uh, select the, 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 the lambs without any defect. And they would wrap the lambs in swaddling clothes. And Jesus was also wrapped up in swaddling clothes or cloth. Why was it? Because exactly what they were preparing the lambs for, Jesus was a lamb of God that was going to be sacrificed. Isn't that amazing? You know, when I, when I heard that, I was, I was kind of thrilled to know that, you know, everything that the, that the Lord did was to show us that Jesus was the true sacrifice that was coming for your sins and my sins. And we can rejoice this morning that Jesus Christ came and died for us. Amen? Amen? And that the birth was necessary for the death. If there was no birth, there is no death. 
So we must rejoice with the fact why Jesus came, you know. I really believe God, God planned, planned all this, our salvation and all that, even before the world was created. Do you believe that? You know, even before you and I were created, the Bible tells us the lamb was slain at the foundations of the world. That means God planned the birth of Jesus Christ to come into this world even before he created you and me. Because God is all-knowing and all-powerful. He knew exactly what was going to go on. So we have, we have everything planned out. If you've got your Bibles with me, turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 18 to 14. Now there were in the same country shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So this morning I want to just express a few reflections of, my, of the significance of, of Christmas with you. So we have, heard the, we have heard the gospel stories about the Magi, about the shepherds, about the virgin birth. And all these are important because it's all what happened on that first Christmas day. Prior to that, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the Bible, there are some references of his first coming and also some references of his second coming. Do you know that the Bible is the only book that talks about the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's amazing, isn't it? He's, he's, it's, it's so important that the Lord foretold us even before Jesus came that he was coming. I want to look at a few, a few you know, uh, uh, scriptures regarding that. The Bible scholars tell us that there's over 300 Old Testament prophetic scriptures and about 47 of the Old Testament verses about the coming of our Jesus, our Messiah. In, 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 uh, the first one is Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. I think it comes up on slides. Be born in Bethlehem. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2, 735 years to about 700 years before Christ, Micah, he prophesies the coming of the Lord. Imagine 700 years before. And then, of course, Matthew 2, 1 tells us, which Matthew was around 48, uh, uh, between 48 and 180, that book of Matthew was written. And then Luke chapter 2, verses 4 and 6, tells us also the same 60 to 80, 80 years uh, after the death of Christ, that book was written. Then it talks about the, the Messiah would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 tells us, Isaiah wrote this book about 700 to 750 years before the coming of the Lord. Then in Matthew 1, 23, tells us the same thing. Then, a, then it tells us a messenger would prepare the way for the Messiah. We're talking about John the Baptist. And Isaiah tells us again in 40, verses uh, 3 and 5. Then Malachi also tells us in Malachi 3, uh, verse 1, Malachi lived about 430 years before the coming of the Lord. In Luke 3, 3, 6, it tells us. Then the Messiah would be declared the Son of God, in Psalms 2, 7. Now, the book of Psalms was written somewhere around 270 B.C. So we find in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. So the Messiah would be sent to heal the brokenhearted. That has been prophesied. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came to heal the brokenhearted. And he has healed many broken hearts here. Amen? He's, he's a healer. And then, of course, it tells us in, in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, it tells us that tells us the Messiah would be a sacrifice for sin. Isaiah tells us the same thing in Isaiah 53, verses 5 to verse 12. And then Romans chapter 5 tells us. So all these scriptures show us of the coming of the Lord. So when I look at Christmas, it is very clear that the coming of the Lord was going to happen. Amen? And it has happened. We know it has happened, but it was going to happen. Aren't you glad that Jesus came and was born? Aren't you glad? I'm, I'm very glad that he came and he was born because if he, did, if he didn't come and he was not born, then of course there wouldn't have been a death as well. So I just want to share with you some, some thoughts that I have this morning to share with you. Uh, Christmas, is a signif si Christmas signifies the arrival of grace. I think uh, uh, Josh shared this morning about grace. 
It signifies the arrival of grace. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. Jesus, was, Jesus became flesh. He was God Almighty. He became flesh. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. The word grace in, is, is the Greek word for charis. Or charis. Six times is translated favor. 130 times it is translated as grace. Almost everywhere the word is translated grace, it is translated as essentially a gift. So God gave us a gift for us to receive. Amen? He gave us a gift for us to receive. In John chapter 1 verse 17, it tells us, For the Lord was given through Moses, grace and truth, truth came through Jesus Christ. So Christmas means coming of grace to the world. You know, none of us can be saved by keeping being good or keeping the law. None of us can be saved that way. Agree? Anybody is righteous because they kept the law or they're doing they're good people? No. We are all are saved by grace and by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace is actually a person. Because the Bible tells us that grace and truth came by Christ. So if grace and truth came, that means we say that Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I am grace. So if Jesus says, I am the truth and I am grace, that means grace is also a person there. So you and I have received a gift from God, which is Jesus. We have received grace today. And without grace, you and I can never be saved. You know, we have lots of religious people around the world, you know, keeping all philosophies, keeping all religious, you know, obligations and doing all of this stuff. But are they justified before God? Are they saved? They're not saved because the only person that can save you and me is, is, or how we can get saved is by grace. So you and I don't need to be proud or you and I don't have to say I'm better than you. We don't have to be, you know, a better than thou sort of attitude. We are all in the same boat. We are all saved by grace. So it was grace that came into this world and that grace is what we have received. Through that grace we have received forgiveness. Through that grace, you know, we have, we have Christ now in our lives. Isn't that wonderful? You know, we don't realize sometimes what God has done for, the, for us. John, 2 John 1, 3 says, Grace and mercy, peace from God the Father and from, the, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. He will be with us. That means God has come to be with us in truth and in love. Amen? So everyone here today has received the favor of God. And we all live in that favor of God. And that favor is upon each and every one of us 24-7. Every day of our lives, you and I live under the grace of God. Because grace has come. And grace is with us. And grace lives with us. As much as the Bible says, God is love, God is grace. You know, so we are, we are very you know, blessed. We are really, you know, favored by God because that's what grace is. I'm a favored man. Are you a favored man and woman? You are because we are all favored people. And because of Christ, because of the coming of the Lord, we are all favored people. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. None of us can boast. We don't, none of us are self-righteous. We are not self-righteous. We are all living under grace, saved by grace. So always remember that grace is a person, and that person is Jesus. And Christmas reminds us of his birth and the beginning of the dispensation of God's grace to a world that so badly needed forgiveness and reconciliation and being brought back to God. I don't know about you. I really need Jesus. I know what a what a... What an awful sinner I was. You know, as Paul the Apostle says, that he was the greatest sinner, the worst sinner. And I also tell myself, I was the worst sinner. You know, there's nothing that I haven't done that, you know, that tells me how bad I was. And we all are on the same boat. Romans 3, 23 tells us we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There's no none righteous. And he tells us in Romans 6, 23, you know, the gift of God is free. The gift of God is Christ Jesus for all of us. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God in Christ Jesus has given us righteousness. So we are all have we are all pleased that as we approach Christmas, remind ourselves that we have been saved by grace 
and grace has come and grace lives in us. Do you know that grace lives in you? Christ lives in you. When you receive Christ into your heart, grace has already come into you. I live by grace. You live by grace. We all live by grace. Just think about, you know, what a, what a situation we were in, what a condition we were in. If it was not grace, we cannot be brought out of this condition and given a position in God. Do you believe you have a position in God? Your position is a son and a daughter in God. That's the message. And what has done that is grace. Grace has done that for you and me. And I know people talk a lot about grace, that, you know, we, you know, we are saved by grace. And because we are saved by grace, you know, you know, everything is like, you know, we are under a canopy of grace, so we can do anything and everything. No, we don't do that. Because when grace comes into, that, to, into us, we start to live the life of grace in us. And grace is, uh, the goal of grace is to purify us and make us holy and change our lives to be more and more like Jesus. So grace has a goal. So the, the purpose of Christ coming and being born is to give us this grace so that we can live a life that is pleasing unto Him. Don't we want to live a life holy? Don't we want to live a life, you know, pure? Don't we want to live a life that will, that will sort of, you know, draw us closer to God? That's why grace has come, because grace has a work to do in our life, and he wants to do a deep work in us. And if we allow this work to, to, to continue in our lives, the purpose of him coming is achieved then in us, because of his grace, and his grace that lives in us. Amen? So always remember that love is a person, grace is a person, goodness is a person, mercy is a person, truth is a person, faithfulness is a person, and what's his name? Jesus. You know, we sit down there sometimes and we think, you know, is all this true? It is true. When you start to experience Christ in your life, you start to experience the grace of God in your life. The favor of God comes upon you in everything that you do. And you'll find that this grace will set people free. There's nothing that sets people free except the grace of God. You know, I was uh, probably the end of early part of last year, I was sitting on my bed. I was, I was having a, you know, uh, infection in my body and I was thinking to myself Lord you know I'm a man of faith you told me you put a spirit of faith in me and I believe you all, all my heart I want you to heal me and the Lord spoke to me and he said to me whatever you get and whatever you do is not because of your faith only and sometimes we want to become giants of faith you want to become like you know you know, people of faith and that's good we, whatever we receive from God has, has to got to do with our faith too but the Lord spoke to me and said, it's by because of my grace that whatever you receive from me, even healing this morning, is because of his grace. Because he has come, grace has come to be with us. And we can rely on this grace of God because this is what will take us through this journey in life. He's coming. You know, we are all Gentiles by birth because we are not Jews. We are not God's natural people. We are Gentiles. We were grafted into the body of Christ. We were not redeemed with silver and gold, but by his precious blood he brought us in. And into this grace, so we have been grafted in. And when he says we have grafted us in, he has made us a part of his glorious body. You know, the body of Christ. You're not just a, you know, living in, in the world and not attached to something. You are attached and I am attached to him. That's why the grace starts to flow into our lives and God meets us in a time of need. Amen. The second thing I see here in Christmas marks the moment the world received the Savior. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm rushing, you know, I'm really rushing today, no time. The world, the, the Christmas marks the moment the world received the Savior. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. As we read through this passage of Scripture, we find that Christmas is about a world lost with sinner, sin. And it's separated from God and, and needed to come back to the Savior. The greatest purpose of God sending His Son is to provide salvation to us. Amen. Imagine living in sin and no, no possible way of making atonement for our sins. You know what atonement is? Atonement is, is the forgiveness of our sins. The world so badly needed, you know, to be forgiven. And there is no way that you and I can be forgiven for our sins except through Jesus Christ. So the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ very clearly shows us that we all need to receive the Savior. Amen? 
a lot of people put a lot of emphasis, and I'm not, you know, running down any denomination or anything. He tells us in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 47, you know, Mary's Mary, blessed woman Mary was, mother of Jesus. I mean, she's absolutely a wonderful woman, selected by God, you know, and called blessed by God himself. And this woman, this is what she said. She said, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Even the great mother of Jesus, not the mother of God, God has no mother. The mother of Jesus, you know, what was her proclamation? I rejoice in God my Savior. Even she needed a Savior. The whole world needs a Savior. That is why this message of, of Christ coming and dying for our sins is important because no man can be saved except through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except he comes through me. You and I can never be united to God without Jesus. He's the mediator. He's the high priest. He's the one who reconciles us. He's the one who regenerates us. He's the one who forgives us. And, and, and not only forgives us, he forgets all our sins. So the world needs somebody that can save them. And the only one that we have is Jesus. That is why it's important for everyone to realize, you know, being good people doesn't take you to heaven. You know, the Bible says our good works are filthy rags before God. Even as a Christian, if you're trying to think I'm a good person, I will go to heaven because of my goodness, forget it. Because you're not going to make it. The only way that you and I can make it is because we have received the Savior. The Savior has come. He tells us that Mary rejoiced in, in, in Jesus Christ, the Savior. The third thing I see, a Christ, a Christmas symbolizes the arrival of God's blessings cascading down to us on earth. Amen. The blessings of God comes to us only through Jesus. Without Jesus, you and I can't be blessed of God. His blessings come through Him. See, every miracle, every blessing, every healing that you receive comes through Calvary. Amen. Comes through Calvary. I will not attribute anything that came from so and so. I went to this meeting or that meeting, you know, that person. No, everything comes from God and it all comes through Jesus. Every blessing that you have received, acknowledge the fact that I am blessed because of Jesus. He came to bless me. He came to, to give me life and life more abundantly. The Bible tells us God didn't spare his only son, but he gave him for us that through him he would give us all things liberally. That's the promise of God. He will not go against his promises. Amen. Genesis chapter 12 verse 2 tells us, remember the promise of God to Abraham here. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So he was talking to Abraham and said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and I'm going to make you a great blessing. So that means God, to bring his blessings into this world, he needed somebody to come into this world that through that person you and I can be blessed. And in the Old Testament, he talks about Abraham. And he tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, sorry, verse 14, he redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. See the connections? Abraham was blessed. And the people of the Jews during that time were blessed through Abraham. But in the New Testament, you and I are not blessed by Abraham. You, the, the blessings of Abraham has come through Jesus Christ to us, the Gentiles. So you and I will all be blessed all the time when we appropriate the blessings that Jesus has done for us on the cross. It will come to us. Through Jesus Christ. He tells us here, the promises were spoken to Abraham and, he, and to his seed. Not seeds, to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds. Meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. You and I can receive today the blessings of God if we will come to Christ. Because Christ came into this world so that you and I can receive the blessings that he has for us. The Greek word for blessed is to be happy, to be fortunate, and to be most envied. Don't you think we've got to go further, come to that place where we will be happy, that we will be fortunate, and we would be 
most envied. I think we're happy people, aren't we? I don't know. I'm a happy person. Are you a happy person? I'm happy because I'm blessed. I heard one preacher say one day, you know, I got the blessings of Boaz. I got the blessings of, of Jabez. And I said, where did you get that from in the Bible? Jabez's blessings? Boaz's blessings? You know, these people do say stupid things sometimes. There's only one blessing for you and me. It comes through Jesus. Not anyone else because anybody else's blessings is limited. But the blessings of Jesus is unlimited for you and me. He says that. You know, have you, I heard, you know, Joshua's generation. Where did Joshua's generation continue? It stopped with Joshua. You see, we get all this nonsense today in the Bible and people gravitate to that. Oh, it's good, it's juicy, it's tickling my ears, <gasps> doing something in my heart, but nothing comes out of it. Let's get back to what God did, sending Jesus to us to receive the blessing that he has for us. Amen. Comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. In Acts chapter 3, verse 26, unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So Christmas is the reason for everything in your life and in my life. All our blessings come from Jesus and our faith in him through Calvary. Remember, it was, it was Calvary that released the blessings to us. Because when he said it is finished on that cross, he finished everything for you and me. He went down to hell. You know, he took the keys off the devil. He smothered him, made him, you know, smothered him means he broke all his teeth and made him, you know, he was, he was just having gums only. So when the devil smiles today, he smiles only with gums. There are no teeth. The Bible says he made a public spectacle of him. You might think this is a joke. It isn't. The Bible, he went and he stripped the devil of all his power, you know, and he rose victoriously and triumphantly. And he has given you and me the power now to be blessed as a result of his resurrection from the dead. Amen. Believe that because sometimes the devil has lied to us that he is still in authority. The Bible tells us all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to whom? To Jesus. Therefore, go now and be blessed by him. Amen. So God has blessed us through his son, Jesus. And the fourth thing I see here, because it's almost 12 o'clock, Christmas initiates the commencement of profound joy. This is where we start to get joy. Our joy doesn't come from things. Our joy doesn't come from, you know, a good, a good family. Our joy doesn't come from a good job and the money in the bank, as a lot of people think. You know, those are temporal things. They are fading. They will come and go. But real joy comes from the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Not just for the angels that day, but to all people, are you experiencing the joy of the Lord in your life? You see, these are the things we got to constantly remind ourselves, where is my joy? My joy doesn't come from her or him or things. It doesn't come from the pleasures of this world or, or what I have inherited. Joy comes from the Lord. And if we would look to him for the joy that he has promised to give us, you know, it becomes the strength in our lives. What does the Bible say? The joy of the Lord is my, my strength. Don't let the devil rob your joy. If he's coming to do anything for you, he's coming to rob your joy that God has given you. Keep that joy. You always tell yourself, I am joyful in the Lord. Christmas reminds me that the joy has come into the world and I am going to celebrate with Jesus all the time because his joy lives in me. You've got to tell yourself, reinforce this because the devil comes to rob what? The word of God out of you. What God has done for you through Jesus. Don't allow him to do that. Let him know that you know, that you know, that he knows, that he knows, that you know, and you know that he knows, that he knows, that you know, that you have received Jesus. And for this purpose that he has come. Amen. Sometimes we've got to rise up, church. We've got to rise up. Nehemiah 8, 10 says, this Christmas, I don't, it tells us the joy of the Lord is my strength. This Christmas, I don't know what you and I might go through this Christmas, but I want to tell you that Christmas is a time of great joy. Amen. You are saved. You have got grace. You are blessed. What more do you want? He came to give you everything you wanted. 
And he says he will not withhold anything good from you because he loves you and me so much. You going to enjoy Christmas? I'll tell you my Christmas story on the 25th when you come. I have a good story. I really do. I really do. So what, what are my thoughts for 14 days before Christmas? Christmas signifies the arrival of grace. Christmas marks the moment the world received the Savior. Christmas symbolizes the arrival of God's blessings cascading down to us on earth. Christmas initiates the commencement of profound joy. That's what Christ came to give us. That's what Christmas is all about. If you don't have that joy with you today, I'll tell you why I want, to, I want you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can I have the worship team come, please? I want you to experience that joy in your life. Experience, you know, God's blessings. You know, we all find out in our lives that we got areas where we lack, don't we? We all do. But why don't we start to believe God that he has come to give us all of this for us to enjoy, for us to have a life and life more abundantly? I believe he wants to give you an abundant life, a life to the fullest, a life that you will enjoy living. I tried everything, I'll tell you. I tried sex. I tried money. I tried power. I tried all of that stuff. It worked for a while, but then it wears out. It wears out. You know, the thrills and all that are there, but it wears out. But with Christ, I found it, it is eternal. It's continual. It doesn't wear out. Oh, yes, we have our, our issues, we have problems. But I want to say that through it all, he's faithful. He's there for you. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to do the best for you. Not the worst. People will want to do all sorts of stuff to you, but not him. Can we stand this morning? And let us, let us really prepare our hearts. I thought Hillary shared so very well about what Jesus Christ came to do. I want to give you, I want you to take that other step today. Take, a, take that step of faith. You know, we can be in church for a long, long time and still not have taken that step of faith and ask Christ to come into our lives. That's the greatest thing. It's not about know about Him. It's about knowing Him personally in this relationship. For 27 years, I didn't know Christ. I knew about Him because I was a good Catholic boy. I was an altar server. We had educated a you know, private Catholic school. Now, I love Jesus, but I never knew him until I was 27 years old. I want you to have, to receive him into your heart today. This is your day. Receive him in. He wants to come in. And when you receive him, your life will never be the same. You begin to receive what I've been just talking to you about. The grace of God will come in. He will come in. You know, he will bless you. He will save you. And joy will come into your heart. I was, on, I, was, I was so, so blessed the day I got saved. And God has blessed me. Let me pray with you. If you haven't prayed this prayer, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Mean it from your heart. Speak to the Lord. He's here. He will hear you. Close your eyes, bow your head, and pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you. You love me. And you send Jesus. And Lord Jesus... I ask you to forgive me for all the wrong I have done. I invite you into my life. I want to receive your grace. I want to receive you as my personal savior. I want to receive your blessings in my life. And Lord, I want to receive the joy that you have for me. I thank you, Lord, that you come into my heart and now you reside in me. I give you all the thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.